a spin one half particle is associated with the, the Dirac Lagrangian. In this case, let me write the Lagrangian like this. So we have LD, which stands for Dirac. So L stands for Lagrangian, D stands for Dirac. So we have the Dirac Lagrangian. Here we have the following field, QF bar. So I will call it like this and I will tell you why. And then here, of course, we have uh, I gamma mu del mu. So you can also write it like this if you want gamma mu del mu. So I mean, uh, raising or lowering in indices is, is something that at this point you, you should be comfortable with. You have to use the metric, the metric tensor. And then we have minus mf. So this is the mass associated to this field. And then we have QF. So in general, when we have a certain theory, we have some fields. The excitation of these fields will have will um, be particles, and these particles have some mass. And in particular, for um, the Dirac particle, we have the mass mf. Then we have to sum over f here. So we are going to sum over f, and let me tell you what f stands for. F stands for the flavor the so-called flavor. It's another property of uh, particles. There are different quarks fields with different masses and therefore different flavors. In particular, the different types of flavors that we can have are the following. We can have the up quark indicated with a U, then we can have the down quark, then we can have the top quark, the charm quark, the strange quark, and the bottom quark. So we have six different types of flavors. So this summation can go from one to six. This is how you can think of these flavors. These different flavors arise from years of experimental and theoretical evidence. Then let me tell you something more about this QF. So Q stands for quark, F stands for flavor, and in general for each quark we, we can have different masses for the different flavors. And the quark field QF can be represented in different spaces. In particular, if we consider the spinorial representation of QF, since we know that its spin should be equal to one half, this can be also represented as a spinner when we want to emphasize the spin of um, the quark. Because we, we can act with this, these matrices on these states, on this particular um, object, like call, let's call them that, and in that case, we can represent them with um, the, the four components that usually one associate with uh, this type of ob objects. But at the same time, we can also represent these quarks with uh, the following th three components. So we have QF1, QF2, and QF3. So this is a different representation, and in particular, this is also called the color representation because each quark can have three different colors and this is associated with SU3, the special unitary group in three dimensions. You have to think that um, the so-called color, which does, I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, an actual color that you can see with your eyes, but it is just uh, a term. So this color is used uh, to Make an analogy with the concept of charge. For the electron, you can have either the charge of the electron, but remember that in general, when you consider the Dirac Lagrangian, you also have the anti electron, which is the positron, and therefore you have to consider the, the opposite charge. In this case, we are in SU3, so we can have different uh, three types of colors. So you can think of them as three different types of charges for, the, for each quark. When we consider the color representation, so when we are making our considerations um, and which are related to the color of the quark, we have to use the SU3 representation. So the quark transforms according to SU3. So we need to use special unitary matrices in three dimensions. In particular, we can write Q alpha prime F equal to u alpha beta u beta f. So we apply a unitary matrix 
to this uh, field so we can use the um, in this case I'm using beta to denote the color index therefore this matrix will only act on the color and you will get uh, you will get another um, field which has a different color in general so you are, are applying this transformation to this uh, state or let's call it um, quark and then you can have a transformation of this kind where the color changes the matrix u is unitary so it means that u u dagger is equal to u dagger u which is equal to the identity and u can be written in the following form so we have e to the minus i gs gs is just a constant then we have lambda a over 2 theta a where a is an index that ranges from 1 to 8 because remember that we have the special unitary group in three dimensions therefore there are eight generators and the lambda a's are matrices so lambda a denotes the generator the eighth generator of the fundamental representation of the su3 algebra the matrices lambda a are traceless so these matrices here are traceless and they satisfy the following commutation relation so we have lambda a lambda b commutator equal to 2i so this is the imaginary unit then we have f a b c lambda c and these f a b c are the so-called structure constants and they are real and totally anti-symmetric as we have seen as in the qed so quantum electrodynamics case we can require that the lagrangian be invariant under a local transformation that is when theta a these parameters here they depend on the space-time coordinates so this is a function of x theta a of x and to satisfy this requirement so to satisfy the fact that uh, the Lagrangian B invariant under a local transformation we need to change the derivatives to covariant derivatives and since we have eight independent parameters theta a we need eight different fields and we will call these fields g mu a of x so when we change the index a from 1 to 8 we have eight different fields and remember that we also need this index mu and uh, i will remind you why we also need this index mu it's a very simple to motivate that because we define the covariant derivative d mu applied to qf like this so we have d mu so this is the usual partial derivative minus i gs lambda a over 2 g mu a x and we apply this of course to qf so you can think of this as a definition but this is reminiscent of what we did in qed and let me also tell you that these fields these eight fields are called the gluons which is important in quantum chromodynamics that, that is the, th the theory that we want to describe here in this lecture in in the, in the following it's a part of the standard model so it's very important for us to understand it so we can also define this in the in the following way in particular we can put together these matrices lambda a with um, these scalars so we have to think of this as scalars these gluons we can define them to be g mu so this will be g mu of x and it will be it will depend on the two indices of this matrix in this matrix so there are some hidden indices inside this matrix because remember that this is a matrix so each lambda a is a matrix so there are also two hidden indices that we can call for example alpha and beta and, and here there are two indices alpha and beta as well so we can also write this as lambda a over 2 and then here we have two indices alpha and beta and then we have g mu a of x so remember that in this case we are summing over a 
and therefore we can define this uh, covariant derivative also like this d mu minus i g s and then we have g mu of x and of course uh, then you have uh, uf here now we want so we want to define the covariant derivative in such a way that it transforms in the following way so d mu qf when we transform it so when we transform this and i will put this prime to indicate that we are going to apply a transformation this should transform in the following way so we have the unitary matrix u and then we have d mu qf so this is something that we are going to impose we will see why but it is something that you can understand also from what we did in uh, QED, in the QED theory. So if we impose this condition, this will in its turn impose a transformation on G mu. And we are going to see why. So in particular, we have the following. So D mu qf prime this is equal to del mu minus i gs g mu and in this case this has to transform because it's the only thing that, that's going to transform it's our field that's going to transform just like in the qed we had a mu and then here we have the transformation of qf so we have qf prime but qf prime can also be written as u qf and remember that u is equal to e to the minus i gs then we have lambda a over 2 theta a so we want to impose that this is equal to u and then we have this right so we have d mu which is del mu minus i gs g mu qf so i know that this kind of notation can be not so easy to follow all the time despite i mean we have gone through the reasons why we should do something like this let me tell you once more why we should do something like this i mean why do we have to impose this condition here it's not complicated to understand that because remember remember that in our theory, if we impose something like this, just like I mean, in QED, remember that, we have terms like this. We have I, gamma, mu, and then here we have to replace the partial derivative with um, the covariant derivative. So in this case, I'm going to write mu as a lower index here, but uh, don't get uh, I mean, uh, confused by the position of these indices you just have to think that you, have, you can apply the metric tensor and you can uh, reasonably understand uh, or make sense of these positions here that's not a problem remember that we have something like this so minus mf and then here we have qf and here we have q bar f and you're going to sum over f but that's not the point so if we consider the second part, so when we multiply qf bar by mf and then qf, you have something like qf bar qf. So when you impose a transformation of the kind qf goes to qf prime, I mean qf becomes qf prime and this is just u applied to, Q, uh, to qf. So when you consider q bar, when you consider qf bar, this will transform like this. It will become q bar f prime. And this is equal to qf bar u dagger. It's simple because you can understand it from here. Right? I mean, if you take the dagger of this, you get qf prime dagger. And then you get qf dagger u dagger. Right? But now, now, at this point, you have to remember that um, Q bar F, this is just QF dagger gamma zero, right? So if you act with gamma zero 
on the right here and also on the right here this part is just qf bar prime and also notice the fact that gamma zero here which is a dirac matrix can commute with this operator u dagger because u dagger is something that acts on the color remember that we have the matrices lambda a lambda a which are three by three matrices so this operator u dagger so they are three by three matrices in that kind of um, representation remember that that we are using representation or different representations the gamma gamma matrices usually are rep represented in a four dimensional space but these matrices act in a different space with respect to these ones so we can also put this gamma zero here on the left of u dagger so this can also be written as q f bar u dagger right so that's why we have this uh, kind of transformation and therefore when you consider q f uh, q bar f prime q f prime this will be exactly equal to q bar f q f because you have u dagger u which is of course equal to the identity and if we impose this transformation here upon the, the, this uh, covariant derivative applied to qf then we um, i mean we can make sure that our lagrangian will remain invariant with respect to this uh, type of uh, unitary transformations so that's why we want such transformations because the lagrangian will remain invariant and it is something that we have already done also in qed with different types of transformations in that case but that's the reason why we're doing that so we impose this equality and from this equation here from exactly this equation we can find the transformation of uh, for g mu prime so let me rewrite this so we can write i g s g mu prime u q f and this is equal to what to d mu u q f minus u del mu q f and then we have plus i g s and then we have u g mu q f so I have simply isolated this term so I have put this on the right and then I have put these terms on the left and this is something that you can write from here now you can see that these two terms can simplify a little bit because they will give you d mu u and then you have qf so all in all what you get is the following equation you get i g s g mu prime u equal to del mu u plus i g s u g mu like this and therefore you get uh, the following so you get the following transformation g mu prime equal to minus i d mu u u dagger we divide by gs plus u g mu u dagger so it's quite simple to get from this one to this one you divide by igs and you also have to act with the u dagger on on the right so this is what you get and this is basically the transformation that we have to impose on g mu so g mu should transform just like this i have g mu which goes to g mu prime like this and the transformation is that then we have qf which goes to qf prime which is equal to uqf and then we also have the 
covariant derivative d mu which goes to u d mu u dagger why is that why i mean why do we have to impose this well it's uh, quite simple because d mu qf transforms as u d mu qf and since qf transforms like this and this is equal to u d mu u dagger u qf and this is just qf prime and this is just d mu prime so this is the transformation of i mean this transformation here is exactly d mu qf prime like this so these are the transformations that we have and we will proceed further next time because i don't want all the, all the all these lectures to be too long and it's necessary for you to be able to understand more thoroughly all these terms we have to think about them and also think about the reasons why we took these steps here but we will continue next time